Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. This is God's word, and we give thanks to him uh, for it. Heavenly Father, as we gather here this morning, all of us are so weak, and all of us need your help, and yet how we thank you that you're the God who is strong, and you're the God who is gracious, and that your power is made perfect in our weakness. And so this morning, would you speak to us, would you give us ears to hear uh, individually what you have to say to us, and would you be our help and our joy and our refuge and strength, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, one of the the issues that many Christians struggle with um, is a lack of assurance. Uh, They often find themselves wondering, am I a real Christian? And I think this morning, if we were all to close our eyes and I was to ask for a show of hands, um, I would probably see a forest of hands uh, before me. Because I think um, it's a question, am I a real Christian? It's a question that probably most of us have asked at one time or another. We ask it for all kinds of reasons. Um, Sometimes suffering is the cause And sometimes life is so hard, we assume that God must have abandoned us. Sometimes it's sin, there's a temptation that hasn't gone away. And it really, it makes us wonder if actually we've changed at all. Actually, has God done something in our life? Are we a real Christian? Sometimes we ask this question when we compare ourselves to others. You know, he just seems so joyful. She never seems to struggle the way I do. Am I a real Christian? Now, we could try and answer that question in different ways. We could ask, try and answer it in ways that would cause lots of problems. We could look in and we could think, have I done enough? Have I changed enough? Have I confessed enough? And we could look around and we could try and conform to the patterns, the behavior of others. But neither of these approaches would help us for long. They'd be more likely to lead to despair. Instead, it won't surprise you uh, this morning to know that I think there are better answers in our passage this morning. 
And I'm not going to try and cover everything in these verses. Instead, I want to answer the question, how do I know I'm a real Christian? To try and answer that question, I want us to think about our union with Christ. Our union with Christ. Just listen to Jesus again in verse 1 and verse 5. This is the, the seventh, the final I am saying. And Jesus says this, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, this idea of the vine, um, someone has called it a metaphor with a history, and I think that's right. Um, at different points in the Old Testament, God's people are compared to a vine in passages like uh, Psalm 80 or Isaiah chapter 5. But here, Jesus picks up that metaphor, and he uses it to describe the relationship he has with his followers. He is the vine. They are the branches. I'm not much of a gardener. I cut the grass, just and maybe a very, very occasionally do some weeding. But even if you're like me this morning, you can see the point Jesus is making. Branches can't grow unless they're attached to the vine. And a branch can't say, I'm an individualist. I believe in my rights. I'm going to produce the best grapes for the best vintage for the best banquet in the land. I'm going to make a name for myself. Of course not. A branch draws its life, a branch draws its very existence, its vitality from the vine. And what's true horticulturally is true theologically. As Jesus says in verse 4, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. So how do I know I'm a real Christian? Or to ask a different question, what actually is a Christian? Well, Jesus is saying that a Christian is someone who's united to him. And part of what that means is that we are completely dependent on Him. I think sometimes people who are considering the Christian faith, they, they worry they won't be able to do it by themselves. They look at Christians, they sometimes get the impression that being a Christian is about lots of activity or looking the right way or whatever it means. And they think, well, I could never be that. I could never do that. Or sometimes, if we've been Christians a while, we can think that, that as we progress, well, we'll sort of just inevitably, we'll need Jesus a bit less. We'll reach a stage in the Christian life when we can kind of do it on our own. And this metaphor, it reminds us that, that nothing could be further from the truth. And the more we go on in the Christian life, the more challenges we face, the more sins we commit, the more we age, the more frustration we experience, the more weakness we feel, the closer we get to death, the more we realize that apart from Him, we can do nothing. A Christian is someone who's united to Jesus. Jesus is the one they belong to. We are the branches united to Him. Now, we looked at John 14 last week. Jesus has promised, if you remember, He's promised a home for us. But later in that chapter, we read something that almost, almost sounds too good to be true. Jesus says, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. So there's a home for you this morning if you're a Christian, a home in the future. And yet God has come by the Holy Spirit. He's come and made His home in you. 
This is why, as Paul says in Romans 8, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Now, we've got a new prime minister, as Chris alluded to in his prayer. Um, and although you, you would have known, you obviously knew that, of course. Uh, it's been on the news so much, hasn't it? Um, every person in our country has a connection to Keir Starmer now, don't they? And when he goes to a meeting of NATO or something like that, he represents you. And he represents you even if you never voted for him, even if you don't like him. We're so used to thinking of ourselves as individuals, but he will make decisions that impact us. And it's like sport, isn't it? What do we say when our team wins? We say, we won. And we say that even if we can't tell the difference between a rugby ball and a football. And it's like union with Christ. And our lives are, are wrapped up in His life now. Our lives are hidden in Jesus now. Our lives are united to Him. And there's an old hymn that says, were you there when they crucified my Lord? The answer is yes. Because the New Testament says we died with Christ. The New Testament says we'll be raised with him. And what happened to him has happened to us. He is the husband. We are the bride. He is the head. We are the body. He is the vine. We are the branches. And yet, what does our union with Jesus feel like? What is it actually like to be united to him? Well, I want to, to highlight three things this morning. Some of you are getting nervous that I've not talked about any points yet. Okay, I've got three points. And the first one is going to be the longest. Now, here are three things that union with Christ means. We're going to take our time looking at the, the first one uh, for the longest, as I said. You can see it in verse 2. The first thing is, here's the first heading, it's just the word pruning. Pruning. Jesus says that union with him means pruning. Every branch of me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he that is the Father, he prunes, that it may bear much fruit. Now, some of us have got such sensitive consciences that our natural response to these verses is to just assume that we are one of the branches that have been thrown away, or that somehow that's just destined to be our fate. Well, some of the commentators, they point out that the focus here is not really on those branches, and Don Carson says the real purpose of these verses is to show us that there are no true Christians without some measure of fruit. But how does that fruit increase? How do we actually grow as Christians? Well, pruning. See, the experienced gardener, they, they know how to prune, they know where to cut. And it, all, it looks so wrong to, to those of us who have got no idea about these things. But notice it's the experience of every branch that bears fruit, pruning. And it's like, I think, Hebrews 12, a good father with his son, the, the Lord disciplining those he loves. Someone has put it like this, the kind of knife he uses will vary. It may be a verse from Scripture that convicts us, a friend who criticizes us, or circumstances that constrain us. Conflict, hardship, failure, and even doubts are used by God to discipline us and produce fruit. So you think of a mature Christian that you know. Imagine interviewing them. Well, I guarantee they, would have, they will talk about experiences like this. They'll talk about how God has challenged them, how God has brought difficulties into their path. And you and I this morning, we often wish that everything was simple, 
We often wish that we would just get whatever we wanted, but God knows what he's doing with us. We bear more fruit as we are pruned. This is our Father's good pleasure. Look at verse 8. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Um, John Newton, he was someone who really understood this. Um, he wrote the hymn Amazing Grace. And yet, if you know his story, he was a, a former slave master and he'd committed some awful things, some awful sins. And yet, after his conversion, he became a pastor. And he became, because of his past, someone who was able to sympathize with his flock because he knew the reality of sin in his own life. But listen to these words from one of his hymns, one of his much less well-known hymns. It begins like this, I asked the Lord that I might grow in faith and love and every grace, might more of his salvation know and seek more earnestly his face. You can, you can hear his desire for godliness, but he goes on. Instead of this, he made me feel the hidden evils of my heart and let the angry powers of hell assault my soul in every part. Yet more with his own hand, he seemed intent to aggravate my woe, crossed all the fair designs I schemed, humbled my heart and laid me low. I mean, in the next, the next verse of the hymn, Newton asks, why? Why does it have to be like this? And then he imagines God's answer, these inward trials I employ from self and pride to set thee free and break thy schemes of earthly joy that thou may find thy all in me. So do you see the irony that the, the very things you and I often think of as evidence were not real Christians, suffering, sin, those experiences, they can be the very evidence that show we're united to Christ, that show that God the Father is changing us, that he's making us more like Jesus, the man of sorrows. Friends, let that encourage you this morning. What does union with Christ look like? What does it feel like? How do I know I'm a, a real Christian? We've talked about pruning. But there's a second thing I want to focus on in our passage. Look at verse 4 to the end. And notice all the talk about abiding. Abiding. That's the second word, abiding. Abiding. I think I'm right in saying that Jesus uses this word abide um, about 11 times, I think, in our verses. And when you think about the word abiding, abiding is not very flashy, is it? We talk about abiding by the law, um, abiding by the rules, and it doesn't sound too spectacular. And when you remember that Jesus was about to return to heaven at this point, it makes the word seem slightly ironic. Jesus says, though, that his followers are those who are in him as he is in them. I mean, it's really intimate language, isn't it? The believer who abides in Jesus will bear fruit, verse 4. We're called to abide in him, abide in his love. But how do we actually do that? What does that actually look like? Well, listen to verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Or look at verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Now, we don't have time to look at absolutely everything Jesus says here, but can you see how relational this is? I'm abiding in Jesus. 
It's not, it's not about following a set of tips. It's not about joining a program. It's not about reading the latest Christian book. It's not about going to the right conference. It's about treasuring what Jesus says and what Jesus commands. It's about speaking to God in prayer. In other words, it's about communication. Now, communication is so important, isn't it? It's important at work. It's important in churches. It's important in relationships. And communication has never been simpler. And we can contact anyone, anywhere, anytime. And yet we often struggle with it, don't we? And when two people stop listening to one another, when they stop talking to one another, the relationship is often reaching the beginning of the end. But the person who's united to Jesus, well, they love his words. And they love to talk to his father and their father. I wonder if that's you this morning. Do you, do you listen to Jesus? There's so many voices, isn't there? Do you listen to him? And do you give him your attention? And do you do that on your own? Do you do that in church? Do you love the things he says? And do you enjoy the access you have to his father and your father? Listen to Paul in Colossians. He's writing to people who were being told they had to look elsewhere to grow as Christians. But he says this, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. How do I know I'm a Christian? What does union with Jesus feel like? Well, we've talked about pruning. We've talked about abiding. Lastly, verses 12 to 17, loving, loving. You see, to be united to Jesus means we're also united to one another. Look at the way he describes us in these verses. He calls his disciples his friends, his friends. A friendship is a wonderful gift, isn't it? Uh, one of my closest friends is someone that I only get to see a few times a year. And yet when we meet up, the conversation, it just flows. If you're a Christian today, do you think of yourself as one of Jesus' friends? And in the Old Testament, Moses and Abraham, they were described as God's friend, but Jesus is the friend that sticks closer than a brother. And first of all, he's speaking to the 12 here, isn't he? But he's speaking to all of us. He's speaking to all those who've been chosen by him. He's speaking to all those he's laid down his life for. Like the, those disciples, we, we know the things Jesus has heard from his Father. It's such a privilege this morning. And because he has loved us like this, well, you and I, we are called to love one another. You know, sometimes I think this can be really difficult, can't it? I think especially in a church our size, um, St. Peter's is a, a fairly big church, and there are people here from all kinds of different backgrounds, but we are called to love one another. There's a poem like this, some of you will have heard it, to live above with saints we love, that will be glory. To live below with saints we know, that's quite a different story. And yet this love, it's what Jesus calls us to. How do I know I'm a real Christian? How do I know I'm united to him? Well, I love the others who are united to him. I love those he gave himself for, even if they look, even if they sound 
very different. Chris mentioned in his prayer just about how polarized uh, the world can be, and division and these kinds of things, politics. I think this is one of the ways as a church family we can be different. Our world is so divided and yet we're called to love. We're called to love people who are different to us. Uh, one of you gave me a book about uh, the I Am Sayings after the first sermon in this series. And it's a great book. The author he goes through each of the sayings. But then at the very end of the book, he has a chapter entitled Bread to Vine. Bread to Vine. And isn't it interesting that the first I am saying is about bread, and the last I am saying is about the fruit that grows on a vine. So bread and wine. And we're not taking communion today, but whenever we do, it's a wonderful reminder that we belong to Jesus and we belong to one another. And though we've not seen him this morning, we love him. And at the same time, we see something of his goodness in his body here on earth. Jesus is the bread of life. He's the light of the world. He's the gate of the sheep. He's the good shepherd. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He's the way and the truth and the life. He is the true vine. He is all of these things all the time for all of us. See, am I a real Christian? In a way, it's the wrong question, isn't it? Is it? The, the real question is, am I united to him? Have I come to him? You know, if you haven't done that, you can do that today. And yet, if you have, well, you have him. And if you have him, if you have Jesus, well, you have everything. Well, let's pray together.